it's fantastic to have someone like Scotty involved with, you know, our Landcorp farms, our farms that we own, um, someone of his calibre. And I guess he's given us a really good sum up of this whole first session that we've been looking at. It's about supply and demand. We can't just increase the number of producers without having our markets well understood, um, creating niche products and, and building the industry slowly. Um, loved the case examples that he gave us around Zespri, New Zealand Wine, Dairy Goat Co-op, uh, New Zealand Merino and Lewis Road Creamery to name but a few. So with all of that calibre of speakers from our marketing and consumer behaviour section, we're now going to move into our research section. And we all know that we can be the best marketers in the world, but without quality products underpinned by rigorous science, we have no hope of competing with the other producers around the world. So I'd like to introduce you to Max. So Max Kennedy is um, from uh, is going to be chairing this session with um, the MB Ag Research Project session. Max is a National Manager, Biological Industries at Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. And he has extensive skills in commercialising nutraceuticals and functional foods and biotechnology. Max has worked as investment manager for multiple large scientific projects and leading R&D for some of New Zealand's key industries. So we've got a man of a lot of calibre here to speak to us now. Okay, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And um, certainly MB is very pleased to support research and development in this area. The program which you'll hear about this afternoon is um, a $5.74 million uh, investment by MB over six years. And just to give you a bit of an insight as to where the government's going and why um, we've chosen to invest in this particular sector. Um, the first thing is if you look at the business growth agenda, um, the aim of the business growth agenda is to double exports by 2025. But if you look at the new version of the business growth agenda that's just come out, it puts a lot more focus on diversifying the economy. And certainly sheep milk, which plays to our historical strengths in sheep and has the ability to add value to our exports, um, it's, it's clear from that point of view. The other thing is the government's Vision Matauranga policy, so it's a really good opportunity to boost um, the Maori economy, and it's fantastic to see some of the Maori players taking part in this programme. It's also good to see the industry players there. And really what they need, the researchers need, is strong uh, input signals from uh, the market, from the companies, to help them design and focus their research efforts. It's a collaboration of um, a large number of research players, so Ag Research, University of Otago, Callaghan, Innovation, and it's a unique program because it considers both the pre-harvest and the post-harvest activities. So you've got integration of the research along the value chain. So I won't speak for much more than to say that the uh, research program really looks at developing competitive advantage. So the topics we'll hear about today are things like sheep milk composition, and if you don't know what is in your product to start with, you can't identify the things that are unique to New Zealand to create competitive advantage. We'll hear about sheep milk functionality, because if you're ever gonna make some claims out in the marketplace, nowadays with the regulation, even in export markets, the regulations are tight around making claims. So you really need strong, rigorous science to be able to um, get that advantage. And lastly, um, there is also a key part of the industry around sustainability and New Zealand's environmental goals. So this program aims to cover a lot of those um, activities, and I'm sure by the end of it you'll see there's a lot of good competitive advantage generated from the R&D. So um, we start off, and uh, researchers are very passionate about their uh, projects, and they tend to talk for a long time. So I've told them to uh, keep it short, and hopefully we'll have a chance for a question or so between each speaker. And so the first one I will hand over to is Linda Samuelson, who has been one of the leaders in this uh, research activity who will talk on an overview of the research program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Max. Um, Ag research is very 
very um, happy to co-host this uh, session together with MB. So, and um, to be a good example for those who follow in this session, uh, I'm, I'm not going to use my full-time allocation, <laughs> even though I'm a scientist. Uh, I will just give you a very quick overview of our research program, and then I will hand over to the other scientists to talk more in detail about their specific areas. So this research program is a partnership. It's a partnership between government, science, and industry. And that's what makes it really exciting. The overarching aspirational goal of the program here is to enable the industry to grow their exports and to reach 200 million by 2030. And, um, whether that's realistic or not, I guess we'll all see in 2030 when we meet for the New Zealand Sheep Milk Conference. So how are we going to achieve this growth in exports? So the research program is going to help to create greater value from the sheep milk. And we're going to do that by knowing what's actually in the New Zealand sheep milk. Is New Zealand sheep milk different to sheep milk from other countries? And what are the components in there that um, we can benefit from and the consumer can benefit from? Because we just heard Scotty talking about Zespri. They're, they're selling a functional food. Uh, they're not selling a fruit that's going to compete with bananas. Uh, they're selling a, something that's good for your health. So we need to look at that as well, apart from all the lovely cheese that, that some, of, some of the industry is producing. Um, as several other speakers have said, we need to increase the volume of milk that we get from our use. And last but not least, it's the environmental sustainability. And I think this morning it's become very clear to me that we're not do doing this just for us, for New Zealand. We're also doing it for all those consumers out there uh, in China and in other countries who also care about where their product comes from and that the environment is happy and the animals are happy. So I'll just quickly go over the four research aims in the program. So the first one is to look at the New Zealand sheep milk and how it changes throughout the year, because it does change. Um, so here, from here we expect to find if there are unique traits of the New Zealand sheep milk. Uh, we will also look at uh, storage and processing, how to best do that. If we come back to the health benefits, we'll look at the functionality of the milk. Um, so what's in there and how can we use that to an advantage? We would like to provide research that can form the basis for industry to, to, um, to, towards functional food claims, which will be, become more and more important. So increasing milk production. We need to come up with suitable feeding systems for New Zealand that will increase both the volume and the value of the milk. And we also, the part of this is also to look at early weaning, but to ensure at the same time that we're not compromising health and welfare of the animals. And last but not least, environmental footprint. We want to ensure that the New Zealand sheep milk industry is, an, is a sustainable industry and that we can have that endorsement so that someone who buys a product from New Zealand knows that it's been found environmentally sustainable. So we're hoping to be able to provide you with a farming system that has a low environmental footprint. Okay, that was all from me and now I'm handing over to the next person. Do we have a, a quick question? Anybody with a... Okay, let's move on to our next speaker. <laughs> who is um, Marita Broadhurst, and uh, will give a talk about uh, sheep milk composition. And I can't stress enough how, um, unless you know exactly what's in your product, you don't have any competitive advantage. And if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. 
Well, it's my pleasure to start the actual research results part of the session. Um, and obviously, we've talked about the collaborations. Um, and I won't go over this, except to say, you've probably seen this as part of uh, Linda's presentation and also the lead-in. You may not be able to see the bold, but the effects of seasonality, you, lactation status, farm of origin, all that effect on the composition, um, feeding into all the outcomes that um, have already been stated. So our partners in this program um, farm from the deepest south through the east coast of the North Island up to the central volcanic plateau. They're all primarily grass pasture feed and they will also have some fodder crops in there which will be lucerne or clover, maybe some chicory or plantain. And of course there's high nutrition value supplement in the dairy shed which is um, obviously that inducement, but also uh, <coughs> a good training tool as well. And they're primarily uh, herringbone based. Uh, that seems to be the uh, choice for our milking parlour, which you've probably seen um, in the news media over time. But we also have um, the rotary as well. We can have very... Uh, High numbers in our herringbone sheds, they can be 60 a side or a double 30 or perhaps even a 10 a side. And we're also looking at the rotary. When you think about milk sampling, you might think of the little 25 or 30 mil pottle that goes off to your favourite test lab somewhere in the country just to check on your vat milk at any stage of the season. Um, but um, when I'm thinking of milk sampling, I'm actually thinking of um, a full milking volume from each animal at each collection time point. Anyone who's come from the dairy cow industry will see we've actually borrowed some of their equipment, which is a quarter milker. Um, so the integrity of that sample is really important at time of collection because we really want to know in a semi-sterile uh, situation as possible, what's in our milk. Now I'm not going to talk about somatic cell counts today, but um, that integrity of the sample is at the time of collection, as you can see, our mobile labs with all the chilli bins, we really need to keep that integrity right through transportation, subsampling for storage, because those samples are the basis that goes out to our collaborators for other research, any in-house research that we're doing, and also to some commercial labs, depending on the focus of the research for any season. So we um, say thank you to our producer partners and our ladies, but also for the people here who have helped me actually in the dairy parlour, we can't actually collect the samples without those dairy staff alongside. So the results I'm going to present today are a very small fraction of the research done over the first two years. It's actually based around individual milk samples and variability studies. Those are made up of around 300 random samples. There's a small cohort of age-selected animals, but there's also some lactation cycle-selected animals. By the time we finish this season's um, samples, we'll have over 600 individuals to be able to um, ascertain variability through our major components of milk which will be um, supplied by mixed genetics, as already has been said. We do run mixed milking flocks pretty much throughout the program, although there is a big drive to do that selected genetics, and there are selected genetics animals in this data set. So we're looking at the fat, the protein and lactose concentration, total solids over the lactation cycle, mm -hmm. We're going to look at that by animal age, and we've also looked at that by calendar month as well. And the data that I'm presenting is from the fresh milk analysis, which you will have got from your vet milk samples in your lab tests. But just to let you know that if you, um, besides getting worried by flies, um, if you actually take frozen milk out, you will get very similar readings 
um, after storage as well. Okay, I'll just go back one. This is the, um, not sure that everyone can see the, <coughs> the key. The blue dots are producer one from year one, and the red dots are producer one from year two, and we have a pro the green dots as producer two for year two. This is percentage of fat over the lactation cycle. And as you can see, some do go out close to those 300 days. But the one thing that you will see is that there's very large variability, and we already have heard the impact on that on processing. Um, and fat is the, has the greatest variability. It has um, an average of just over 6%, but the range is anywhere between 1.6 to 16%. We do have information around those as well. But the other thing is that protein has quite a high variability through the lactation cycle. Getting numbers around these um, things is actually really quite um, important. But in this instance, again, if you look at the average, it pretty much sits on a one-to-one -one ratio with the fat, um, but a range of between 4 and 11% across the season. But if you look at lactose, it's a much tighter um, concentration range. It pretty much <coughs> looks to go down as the increase of protein and fat go up towards the end of the lactation cycle. We're looking at just under a 5%, which is pretty close to most ruminant lactose levels, um, but with a range much tighter of between 3 and just 6%. So what we've actually found is that the total solids is pretty much driven by the concentration of fat and protein in the milk samples across the range of uh, the lactation cycle. Ranges between 12 and 32%. Now 32% solid is really great if you're making cheese. It might be a little bit of concern if you're a processor, as we've heard. Um, the ratio between the fat and protein does look like on average one, po one to one, which is great, but there's a, quite a variability across the season for that as well. What we're looking at here, though, is we did also mention that we were interested in the age of the animal and the impact that that might have. The, um, this is a variance component result um, of, those, of those animals. Um, so, as you know, uh, some of our partner producers are non-seasonal lambing uh, as their farm system regime, so that means we can collect uh, different stages of lactation at any time of the year if we go and collect from them. We can have early, mid and late lactation through the year. So maybe it's a bit hard to see from the back, but we have a blue and a red line um, and those are the spring and the summer collections across days in milk for both for fat and protein and lactose. The black line is actually the autumn collection. So what you can actually see there is that probably consistency over your spring and summer, still allowing for the significance of the lactation cycle, you go into the autumn and it is very different in, in the concentration of those components. Oops, sorry, oh, too many clicks. Sorry. So days in milk is significant. There is no significant difference um, generated by age of animal. If you've got an older animal still in your milking flock, it was probably because she was a good animal to start with. Um, whereas the calendar month is significant. Because we do have um, the opportunity to look at the effect of lambing month on seasonal volume, we did that for the second year of the program and we were able to ascertain as you got to after Christmas lambing and everyone who's an artisan milker will go after Christmas lambing, the seasonal volume does go down However, the total solids are still there. So 
again, um, that's of interest. If we are looking at an industry that will be supplying product uh, through the year. So just one of the last slides I have is a comparison with cow's milk. Um, the total protein and fat is a combination of the first two years of collection. So as you can see, the averages look um, as we would expect when compared to cow's milk, the much higher protein and fat. But what is um, most different is the variability in the range. So we could say we want to have everything very much um, consistent for our processing, but also we might be able to um, actually make use of variability for different marketing through the year. So just in summary, there is uh, variability driven, and it's driven by fat mainly, but fat and protein content, and there is very high total solids. There is a significant effect, as you would expect, by lactation cycle, but even just as much by calendar month. And again, that will have processing impacts. The, if you average it, though, it looks very much consistent across New Zealand processes, just on the starter. And you could say, well, it doesn't really matter where I farm because it will be consistent. Um, it's also consistent across years on any one farm and it's consistent with reported levels. There is lots of data which actually confirms that, which I don't have time to go into today. But obviously, this variability has a large impact on processing, and um, as Linda has already alluded to, the optimization of storage, and we've begun that work already within the program, and we'll probably report on that next year. But if there are any uh, areas of interest, I'm open to take questions on that. And if you don't have time now, we could have maybe time through the rest of the conference program. Thanks very much. Um, there's a lot of very useful stuff in that uh, slide, particularly intriguing about the age of the animal and uh, a lot of those fundamental uh, variables good to get a handle on. One quick question. I can... Uh, I was, I was just wondering whether you'd done any analysis um, with regard to the composition of milk in very early lactation between different production systems. So, for instance, a share milking uh, pr production system where you're sharing the milk in the first 30 days with lambs versus taking the lambs off shortly after birth and, um, and, uh, and, 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 taking, and taking all the milk. Um, yeah, okay, have, have you so noticed any differences there? Or? Um, can I say that study actually was underway this lactation cycle, and um, I have to admit the data analysis around that hasn't been done, um, but yes, that it is part of the program as well, early weaning and situations and shared, yes. Great, thank you very much. We'll now move on to um, Mikhail Gostovsky from Callaghan Innovation. And Mikhail spent his career finding lots of weird fats and lipids in all sorts of biological materials in a range of industries. And if you want a person who's going to find you competitive advantage, uh, this is the man. And uh, he has uh, had uh, quite a career on it. Over to you. Uh, my name is Mikhail Gostovsky. And you can guess that I am Russian, and you will be right. I was told that Russians speak, Russians speak with terrible German accent, so for next maybe 10 minutes you will need to somehow survive. And actually I was prepared to talk for about an hour and a half, <laughs> but I was restricted just to 10 slides. <laughs> so And uh, keep to time, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. We received a lot of Amazing samples. Thank you, Marita. Marita collected all of them and forwarded us in perfect conditions. And we were required to perform a number of assays in the lipid 
area. And for those who are aware about lipids, uh, generally they believe that lipids are fats. It's not exactly true. Of course fats, but uh, considering uh, current understanding, lipids are ultimate bodily controllers. They're responsible for all bodily functions. You fell in love, you get sore throat, you feel great, all lipids. You have nice good night's sleep, lipids. <laughs> so, and when we uh, receive such an opportunity to look closely at sheep milk samples, and you will be surprised, by the way, a lot of publications on cow milk. There are some on goat milk, but lipids in sheep milk, it's pretty minor area, strangely enough. And our lipid team at Callaghan Innovation, we can do some pretty advanced lipid analysis and some things we can do, maybe just a couple of laboratories in the world. And so we uh, were to perform analysis of total lipid content, fatty acid profiles, neutral lipid classes, and that's something that almost everyone can do. Common phospholipids profile, that's a bit more difficult, plasmalogen forms of phospholipids, medium chain trials of glycerols, beta palmitate, detection of located phospholipids, glucosyl lactosyl ceramide content, and major gangliosides. I will explain uh, later why it was important, but at first, that's our results. Of course, before we started all this analytical work, we looked in the literature. It was no use for us just to reproduce someone's work. We wanted to know already what has been done. And we were surprised to find out that New Zealand sheep milk is different from European milks. And uh, just uh, if uh, I need to explain, yes, we are quite credible. We maintain our presence in American Old Cave Society laboratory proficiency program. We have uh, AOCS approved chemists and we have techniques which are approved by International Accreditation New Zealand. And then we found that overall uh, total lipids content in New Zealand sheep milk was way higher than that reported for Euro European milk. Uh, the major factors, according to the literature available, major factors affecting quantitative and qualitative composition of milk, lactation stage, that's total fat content, season, breed, genotype, and feeding. But it's interesting that there are publications which claim that breed and diet is not that important, but as combination of breed and diet. Sometimes by choosing right breed and right diet, you can get absolutely different profile of lipids. So uh, we found that sheep milk total lipids content was higher than that of cow milk, and way higher than human milk. Uh, I found one paper uh, which started with the words, superiority of sheep milk over cow milk is linked to its polyunsaturated fatty acid content. And uh, if you look at these red letters, figures, that's major difference between avine milk and bovine milk. We are living in very interesting times. Some things uh, which you can hear now would be considered a heresy 10 years ago. And for example, uh, if you look at the level of saturated fatty acids, everyone knows saturated fat is bad. Well, it's not exactly true. You need saturated fat. And especially interested is this medium chain, six to 12 carbons. And you can see that actually content of such fatty acid in avine milk about 2.5 times higher than that of bovine milk. The second very important thing is conjugated linoleic acids. Conjugated linoleic acids is actually trans fat, but it's good trans fat. And it's uh, uh, conjugated linoleic acid, they suppress inflammatory processes in body, and there are claims about anti-cancer activity and so on. 
And you can see that actually if you compare CLA 18 to CLA, you will have about four times higher content than that of in bovine milk. And polyunsaturated fatty acids, while they are not as high as in milk of, uh, say, Sudanese or French uh, women, they are still way higher than that of bovine milk. So that's already difference, very good competitive difference. One of uh, directions in developing infant formula is uh, humanizing it. And one of the major components of human milk is so-called OPO, or beta palmitate. It's about 11% of total uh, fat in human milk. Uh, unfortunately, when we checked uh, content of OPO in sheep milk, it was as low as in cow milk. So in this sense, uh, OPO may not be considered or sheep milk as a uh, ex exceptionally good component for infant formula. But unfortunately or fortunately, just the last year, uh, European Food Safety Authority concluded that OPO uh, does not support all these claims like uh, reducing constipation babies and removal of calcium. So now OPO uh, maybe is not uh, considered to be as important in advanced, in, as important component of uh, advanced infant formula as just a few years ago. Everything is changing very fast. That's very interesting feature, medium chain triacylglycerols. According to current understanding, medium chain triacylglycerols, and they are called medium chain triacylglycerols because they are much shorter than normal uh, triacylglycerols. MCT abbreviation, MCTs are a food of choice for any organism with uh, increased energy needs. If you have organism that grows fast, infants, or say someone recovers after major surgery, or sportsmen, medium chain triacylglycerols are extremely important. And look at that. That's where we were very much surprised because if you look at information for cow and uh, European sheep milk, you will see pretty low levels. But this uh, medium chain triacylglycerols in New Zealand sheep milk, they have way higher levels. It means that there is just almost ready product for uh, so-called food for special needs. It's already there. Uh, so, but we also did a very interesting study uh, profiling medium chain triacylglycerol content against basin milk. If you are to produce medium chain triacylglycerols rich product. Where, when to collect, when to collect milk. And you can see that early lactation, low days in milk, you will have huge fraction of medium chain triacylglycerols, these uh, red squares. But if you are after a product that contains high levels of lipids, late lactation is much, much more promising. Polar lipids, phospholipids. Wow. Uh, phospholipids, <laughs> it's very interesting thing. There are two major phospholipids in sheep milk uh, which are present at higher levels than in cow milk. So-called sphingomyelin. Sphingomyelin is great for gut health, especially for infants. And you can see a comparison of sphingomyelin in sheep milk to anchor blue top milk, we just bought it in shop. There is one more very interesting uh, lipid, so-called ethanolamine plasmalogen. Recently, Japanese started very serious studies and they found that ethanolamine plasmalogen is great in reversing senile dementia. It's also great, uh, there were claims that ethanolamine plasmalogen is extremely important for 
uh, fetal growth, for infant growth. So you have this lipid and your child will have higher IQ. Well, I'm not sure about that because uh, our data shows that uh, sheep milk, uh, considering ethanol amine plasmalogen, is exactly in the middle between cow milk and human milk. So I'm not sure if uh, sheep is somewhere, according to IQ, closer to human than cow. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, but it's very interesting information, and you can see that content of ethanolamine plasmalogen is rather high, and way higher than in cow milk. So, very interesting thing. Ten years ago, Dr. Elliot from Hamilton published uh, a paper which was uh, with the title uh, Diabetes Man-Made Disease. And the thing is, he compared production of dairy and consumption of dairy products, processed dairy products, uh, and uh, numbers of diabetes, diabetes pandemic in the world. And he found that actually they match very nicely each other. And what happened later, research in Japan, Germany, and South Korea, they demonstrated that yes, if you have, for example, uh, you heat milk, and you have lactose and phosphodyl ethanolamine, or you spray dryer in improper conditions, you will generate uh, substantial levels of glycated phospholipids. In some European uh, infant formula, the levels are just terrible. We were unable to find any traces of glycated phospholipids in the samples provided uh, by egg research. By egg research. Uh, we were unable to find any gangliosides, and gangliosides, they are important for building uh, infant defense against pathogens. So, but it's a uh, well-known fact that sheep milk has lower levels of gangliosides. And when we looked at polar lipids, which are extremely important glycosphine lipids for development of immune response in babies, we found that uh, sheep milk has higher content of these beneficial components than cow milk. An interesting feature was that one of the uh, samples, you can see it was way out of the picture. And when we looked at it, we found that it was different in quite a number of, there were very unusual phospholipids present there. There were very unusual levels of glycosphine lipids. And what happened, uh, we later we were informed that uh, this sample was unique. It was a sample from preclinical mastitis. So it means that our techniques, they are actually very good in detecting preclinical mastitis. You can do it easily. So the results. Sheep milk contains higher levels of certain beneficial lipid components when compared with cow milk lipids and also when compared with uh, European sheep milk. We know now that lipid content and profile in the samples we were dealing with change with lactation stages and geographical location. I can actually, looking at the tables, I can tell you, oh, this sample came from location one. That's for sure, it's late lactation and it came from over the ridge. Uh, and we believe strongly that sheep milk lipids might find their application in novel products. They are unmatched. No cow milk can produce that spectrum of beneficial properties. So foods for special needs, that uh, looks most promising right now. Thank you. And I Thanks very much, Mikhail. I think what we've heard today here is the beginning of the New Zealand story and how New Zealand sheep milk is different to um, some of the others throughout the world. And that's extremely significant. And I think we'll look back at this uh, early research as giving us the tools to be able to create that New Zealand brand story. Um, and so a very uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, Mikhail. And uh, we won't entertain questions for this one. Go and see Mikhail at the next break. Thank you. And if you have any questions about how we did this, if you have some concerns, oh, no.
there are about 20 slides more about describing how it is used. They're yep. not slides. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, that was about what's in milk. The next presentation is proving that it does something. And so uh, we're going to um, have the next speaker, which is Wayne Young, on um, gastrointestinal physiology and what milk does in the gut. Because um, the gut is now universally regarded as another human organ and its implications of things from mental health right through to um, a range of diseases and inflammation is quite uh, profound. So over to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm just going to um, update you on some of the, the research we've been doing in the program looking at the uh, health effects of sheep milk. Um, so we've heard that lipids are probably the most important uh, compound, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's true. I think the gut bacteria are possibly the most important thing. But anyway, um, so the reason we're, we're doing this, this sort of work is that there are a lot of anecdotal um, opinions or, or evidence on the benefits of of uh, sheep milk. So there's a wide range of opinions on its effects on reducing allergy and that it's high in protein, high in nutrients, that it's good for those that are lactose intolerant. Um, however, when you actually look at the literature, there's actually not a lot of controlled scientific studies out there. And in, in fact, in terms of lactose intolerance, I mean, sheep milk has as much, uh, possibly even slightly more lactose than cow's milk. And lactose is lactose, you know, that it's not actually there's not a sheep form and a cow form, it is lactose. So if you're lactose intolerant, uh, sorry, if you can drink sheep's milk and you couldn't drink cow's milk, it's likely not to be the lactose that's, that's the difference. But uh, anyway, so in, in our program, we are wondering what the, the biological uh, activities of the sheep milk are, and there are a number of um, avenues we're pursuing. So looking at their effects on the intestinal intestinal uh, gut bacteria on uh, gut health, um, differences between raw milk and pasteurized milk. Um, so often selling raw milk is probably not something that's going to happen too much, but it's important to understand the properties of the raw product. And so if you're designing methods to, pres to preserve the raw product, you want to know what you're trying to preserve. Um, we and in part of this program, if we any specific uh, outcomes from the compositional analyses, we can design uh, studies to, to examine these to see if we can tease out uh, other health benefits. And so, um, and finally, looking at, we're interested in uh, the uh, nutritional properties and any immune modulating uh, effects of the sheep milk. So I'm just going to um, talk about one study. So we, to, to try and get an understanding of some of these, these really fundamental properties of sheep milk, we did a, um, a feeding study with rats. So you might, you might ask why we're using rats. Well, to excuse the pun, human clinical studies are a totally different animal. Um, they're, they're very, very expensive and, and it's, it's quite, a, quite a big undertaking. But where animal models help is that they can provide important, uh, uh, important information that can help inform uh, future human studies. So what we did is we took, it's a very basic study, we took uh, rats, uh, young rats, newly weaned rats, so to model uh, a, growing, uh, a growing animal, and we fed them sheep milk for 28 days, so either raw, whoops, see, raw cow milk, raw sheep milk, or pasteurized sheep milk for 28 days. And during this time they also had access to solid food, um, and after 28 days the rats were euthanized and we collect the samples to do um, various analyses. So, oh, okay, it's a bit of a delay. So this is the, the milks that we fed these animals. So we had the raw sheep milk, pasteurized sheep milk and raw cow milk. And you can see that the, the protein levels are not quite double that of the cow milk, but pretty, yeah, fairly close. There was, there's more fat as, as we um, have heard. And the, the total solids, in, in our case, there's the sheep milk. So this pasteurized sheep milk was the same as this raw sheep milk, but pasteurized, so it was the same batch. Um, so it was about 20-ish percent. And actually the cow milk we use, this is uh, raw organic cow milk, that was a bit higher than, than, than uh, what you would normally expect to see. So first things first, so these rats, when they were fed for 28 days, they all gained weight 
extremely rapidly, um, so they obviously were quite healthy. But there was no difference in body weight gain, so at first glance, not a lot going on. They, um, but when we had a, had a closer look, and we looked at the food consumed and how much, how much solid food they ate and how much milk they consumed, we saw some interesting patterns. So remember, these, these rats all ended up at the same weight. They all gained the same amount of weight. Um, and in this particular case, the, the rats given raw sheep milk and raw cow milk also drank the same amount of milk. But it look, turns out that the rats fed the raw cow's milk had to eat a lot more solid food. So to maintain the same amount of weight, and given th and that they drank the same amount of uh, milk, they had to eat more food, um, which is, I guess, not surprising when you uh, consider the difference in uh, milk solids. But actually, the, the difference here is greater than, is greater than that, that difference in milk solid composition would, would suggest. So that was, that was an interesting um, observation. So next we wanted to have a more uh, closer look at what was going on in the gut. So we looked at the gut gene expression. Um, so when you, so by examining what genes are being expressed in tissues, you can start to get a, uh, an idea for what's going on, what the genetic machinery and the cellular machinery are doing. And when we looked at the expression profiles of all these genes, so um, by microarray, these, these are technologies that allow us to measure th uh, tens of thousands of genes at once. We find that some genes in some treatment groups were expressed differently to others. Um, there are many, many genes, so we're not going to go over them individually. But what you can do is you can group them together into functional classifications um, and see how that these, these functions relate to each other. And what we found was that the genes that were differently expressed between rats that were fed the sheep milk or the, the cow milk those genes that were different all tended to be related to cell and tissue growth and development, cell cycle tissue development. So there's possibly something going on in the gut um, in terms of um, gut maturation or gut development that's a little different between the two. And at this stage, we're not, we, we can't pin down what these exact differences are, but that's, that's certainly an interesting uh, start. Um, so then now in moving on to the difference between the rats that we fed, the pasteurized sheep and the raw sheep milk, so we saw another interesting observation. So remember, these rats all gained the same amount of weight, they, they all weighed the same. Um, the pasteurized sheep milk and the raw sheep milk rats, they all ate the same amount of food, and yet somehow the pasteurized sheep, the milk rats had to drink more pasteurized sheep milk to maintain the same amount of weight. So it suggests that pasteurization is somehow affecting the uh, bioavailability of nutrients, and it could be the fats or lipids, it could be the proteins, we don't really know, but it is having an effect. Um, and looking, and so there are lots of analyses to do, but actually when we look at the gut uh, bacteria, and in the guts there are hundreds, maybe even close to a thousand different species of bacteria, all doing, all in quite a um, complex ecosystem. But when using sequencing technology, we can uh, look at the, the relative abundance of, of many, many different types of bacteria in the gut all at once. And one of the standout, um, one of the most striking differences we saw was that in rats fed the raw sheep milk, there's much more of this porthoromonodaceae family um, than in those that were fed the pasteurized milk. So these, this is a reasonable, so these made up 25% of the proportions in the gut, the large gut, large intestine of these rats fed the raw milk, whereas in the the other group, they were close to 15-ish percent. So, so that, we, that was interesting. Um, unfortunately, the role of this group of bacteria in health is still to be determined, but however, um, what we do know is that this group of bacteria are related against, is, is being shown to be protective against clo uh, Clostridium difficile infection, which is a rather nasty, nasty uh, infection. And also, a number of studies have, um, also in r uh, rats, have shown that this group of bacteria is uh, much more prevalent in the rats that were fed human breast milk compared to infant formula. So, and if we consider infant, uh, human breast milk to be kind of a gold standard as such, um, to, to have an idea of, 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 of uh, what, um, what we can do to try and make uh, these ruminant milks more mimic uh, human breast milk uh, would be an interesting, interesting thing to look at. 
So, just to sum up, uh, there were no dif uh, in our study there were no differences in uh, rat weight gain. However, to maintain the same amount of growth, rats that were given the raw cow milk had to eat more food. And in comparing pasteurised sheep milk to pasteurised raw milk, uh, those rats had to drink more um, drink more milk. Um, we found that the cow and sheep milk may have different effects on uh, tissue growth and cell growth in the intestines. And the difference between the pasteurised and raw sheep milk uh, presents maybe opportunities for us to explore developing processing methods to better preserve the quality of milk. And of course there are many uh, future studies, we have other plans, and, and the, these ones will be looking at um, digestibility and bioavailability. So, thank you. for a question also. Does anybody have any questions? Lots of happy rats out there. Well fed ones anyway. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, that was a, uh, a, a beginning step along a very long road which is trying all the, uh, all the different health properties that uh, sheep milk may possess. And I'm sure as we see things develop into the future, what we're going to see is uh, taking a leaf from the, uh, the other dairy industry, the bovine one, we will start fractionating the milk, we will start separating the proteins, we'll start chopping them up, and then we'll start looking at the biological effects as well. So um, very encouraging early studies. So our um, next speaker is David Stevens from Ag Research and the influence of live weight, live weight gain profiles of ewe lambs between 12 and 20 weeks of age. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Max. I always love um, listening to those guys. Uh, Mikhail, in particular, he always validates everything that we do. Basically, he got up here and he told us New Zealand sheep milk is different and is really good for you, he said. It may well prevent you getting Alzheimer's, it'll make your kids smarter, and you may well not get bowel cancer. That's fantastic news. Excellent stuff. But the, the, the real point here is that it validates the stuff that we do. I'm in our farm systems team and I lead our nutrition, the nutrition and feeding section of this. And the point is that what we do is create a raw product that somebody can add value to. So Scotty Chapman's up here telling us we have to add value and it has to be a product with integrity and everything else. And Mikhail is able to, to, to validate my existence by being able to say that it is a good product. Um, so what, do, what are we doing? So we've, we've done some reasonably significant um, work looking at the international literature. And as Mikhail said and as um, Marita pointed out, New Zealand sheep milk is different. Our conditions under which we grow it are different as well. And you'll remember when Linda put up some photos and she showed hundreds of sheep on green pastures. That is not the international standard. That's our standard, and that's one of the points of difference. And it's one of the points of difference that we found in our literature reviews was that uh, to gain information about the kinds of systems that we run, pasture-based systems, we cannot look to the international literature for. We have to do it ourselves. And that's one of the reasons it's a reasonably strong component um, of this particular bid. So... What we're, what we're hoping to do in the long term is to create some guidelines around rearing young stock and then feeding them as well as we can to extract the most milk out of them as possible. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of our, our hogget rearing program and then um, Sue McCord, also from Ag Research, is going to come up and talk to you about rearing lambs as soon as they are born. And one of the reasons that we have focused so hard on those two aspects is actually because of the collaborations that we have with our industry partners. They have been absolutely fantastic in providing us with their problems very, very specifically. And some of them might be teething problems as we get started, and some of them will be long-term problems that we need to solve. And so they are, they are really important things. What we're, the big aim here is to try and get more milk out of the milking ewe. 
And the way that we see that we can best do that is to make sure that the hoggard is well grown, she enters the flock, and then we can extract milk from her, So, which is again why we've looked at early weaning systems as well. And, and a lot of our um, European partners don't wean lambs from their mothers till, till six or eight weeks of age. Uh, we need to do it before that to make sure that we have that robust supply going into the supply chain to make sure that Scotty and his team can do their jobs. So that, that's the sort of thing that we're looking at. One of the other parts to it, and uh, Natalie will get up and talk a wee bit about um, the environment, is also animal welfare. So what we need to do is make sure that our lambs are born and grow and enter the food chain as another, um, another opportunity for, for uh, our dairy sheep farmers. So what I want to just talk to you is around um, looking at improving um, the, 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 the hogget and its growth. Now, again, looking at the, um, the literature, somewhere between 12 and 20 weeks of age is a reasonably critical time for the young lamb, the young ewe lamb, heading towards puberty. And through this time, her growth rate is relatively uh, important to her in terms of going through puberty and in laying down new mammary tissue, right? And therefore, we want a good, strong udder as we go through that process. So we were able to um, borrow some sheep off one of our partners, borrow some new lambs at about 12 weeks of age, and grow them through the summer on, on uh, two different pathways. Um, what we call a high pathway or a medium pathway, and you can see them diverging through that part of the season, through to about from week 12 here, through to about week 20. And then we've swapped them over and put them on different pathways. So some remain on high, some go from high to medium, and some go from medium to high as they go through puberty. And they hit puberty around about the start of May, about then. Now, the interesting thing in this is not that we got differences in, in live weight gain. Where my little point is gone. Here it is. That's about five kilos different. You know, these, these lambs are around about 40 kilos, which is not bad. That's, that's fairly par for the course for New Zealand industry. These ones are about 45 kilos up here. The really interesting thing is what was going on down here. And this is what you can see over here. So these are ewe lambs um, being marked as pregnant through their first cycle and then through their second cycle. You can see that those that were down here on the medium track um, had a lot less going through the cycle in, the, in there. Even though from an industry point of view we would have said those are both quite acceptable weights. So what we're seeing is that they are entering puberty at a different time. So that's one. We're starting to tease some of this out. In fact, these growth profiles are actually quite important to whether or not our hoggets get in lamb. And then as we go on, we want to know what are they going to do in the future? And so it's Adrian, one of our co-authors, and some of our team from Mimbermay, so we go through and we do an ultrasound on the mammary gland to see how it's developing at around about, or this were just after the ram payout, so it's around about June. We have a look at that and we see how much mammary tissue is there, how much is built up, because again, this approach to puberty is really important in terms of lifetime performance. Let me just go to this graph here. And what we see there so you, you'll note there's, there's all sorts of bits and pieces across here. So the ductal area, that's the teats, that's relatively straightforward, we know what that's happening there. There's the fat pad. The fat pad in general is, is the, the pad that, that the, the uh, mammary tissue is anchored on. And we can see here that the, the early highs, these are both the early highs, have more fat than the mediums, the early mediums, right? So what the cattle literature tells us is that if we get too much fat laid down before she goes through puberty, she might not perform particularly well. The parenchyma tissue here is 
the tissue that actually provides the milk. Okay? And the important part there, where's my little thing? Here it is. Is that the medium, medium, so the slower growing ones, although they went through puberty a bit later, that actually is significantly different from the other three. So growing them just a little bit slower, although it delayed their puberty a wee bit, has given them an opportunity. Ah, hang on. There we go. That's it. My little red button's a bit hard to push. It's given them the opportunity to lay down more tissue that may be available later on for, uh, for lactation. Now, is that going to be significant? We are unsure. What we are hoping to do is to track those animals through their lifetime uh, and see exactly what that means in terms of performance. But as I say, the literature tells us that it should be important and we need to figure it out here. So our preliminary study basically says that there's a trade-off there. They may not all get pregnant, but and it's always a, a feature that farmers ask us, if they don't get pregnant as a hogget, should I still keep them into the flock? And the answer here is, maybe you should, but we'll find out in the future as to what that means. And uh, so this program is now ongoing, and we'll be looking at that lifetime performance, and we'll be recruiting more animals into the program in the coming years. Hopefully we'll also be able to link this through to some of the genetic studies that might be talked about tomorrow. So I will just again thank all our partners there. They've all been key to making sure that the type of research that we do is, is very relevant to, uh, to what they need to do next. So um, I'll thank you for that, and uh, do we have time for questions? Yes, we Max? have some time for questions. Anybody have a question? Yep. What type of milk powder have you used? What type of milk powder have you used for raising those lambs? Is it a the cow powder, or is it a ewe powder? Alrighty. So, so those those lambs there are raised from weaning onwards. So they're all on grass and grain. But hold that thought because the next speaker, um, Sue McCord, will be talking about early life rearing, and uh, she'll be able to tell you a little more about how we've done that. Great. Um, I've got a question, and um, just looking at it from a farmer's perspective, farmers always ask the tougher questions. Are we in a position yet where? Um, you could answer a farmer's question around what should I do differently? Do differently about what? About feeding or anything else to maximise the results that you're seeing there. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the secret is? <laughs> no, it, it, generally though, what, actually the next step in this process, Max, and a good scientific answer is it depends... Um, the, the next step in the process is to actually work through what the economics of the implications are. Yes. So, so how many, how many, what's our trade-off between the number of hoggets that may go into the milking flock in year one versus year two, and what's that trade-off in terms of lifetime performance in terms of milk? So, so um, yeah, we can talk about that, and it will depend on the system that they're going to choose. So, for example, if somebody wasn't going to mate hoggets, then I would say that growing them a little more slowly will be a good idea for them. Okay, thank you. We have some more questions over here. Just one comment. I can share my experience that you're expecting to have something like 20% <clears throat> more milk in the first lactation. In terms of if they were mated as a hogger? The, the lean hoggets, the one who have been growing in a moderate rate, comparing mm. to the high rate, will produce 20% more milk. There we go. And does that carry on through the rest of their life? Right. There we go. Excellent. Look at that. It's a good thing we brought in an expert. Just a quick, quick question, David. Were uh, the differences in the per treatment effect on parenchymal growth, was that statistically significant? Yes. Yeah, they, they are statistically significant. Yeah, there's, there's 300 hoggets in that study, um, so 75 in each of the high, medium, medium, high cohorts. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.
Next, we've got uh, Sue McCode, who's going to talk to us on designing early weaning approaches to optimise the system. For those of us that are not gifted with height. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to come and speak today. Um, just in response to the last question around the, uh, what we fed the, the lambs and um, more information around artificial rearing, um, the topic of today's talk is about early weaning of lambs that are reared by ewes on farm. Um, but if you've got questions about artificial rearing, we have done a number of uh, studies, so feel free to come and have a chat with me, or if we've got some time at the end, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, so the purpose of this study was to, to focus in on um, systems where we're not artificially rearing lambs. So there's two systems that are predominantly used. One where we take the lambs off the ewes at about two days of age and we rear them so that we can put the ewes on the milking platform. Or the other system is where we leave those lambs with mum and we let, them, um, let the mums do all the hard work and rear those lambs and then wean them at anywhere between six and eight weeks of age or, or longer. Um, and so, as uh, David mentioned earlier, we can't actually rely on a lot of the international literature because they use very, very different systems. Um, they're not um, the pasture-based system that we've got here, so we need to actually understand um, whether we can actually optimise that system um, for New Zealand conditions. So, about 25% of the milk um, produced by you um, is produced in that first month of lactation. Um, and we know that a dairy ewe can actually produce a lot more milk than what a lamb needs for, for normal growth. Um, and the systems that have been used overseas are predominantly um, indoor systems. Where there's been scientific literature um, for, from those systems, they've been based on indoor systems. Um, and they're a mixed system where the lambs are allowed to, to suckle from the ewe, but then are separated from the ewe for a period of time during the day. Um, so that the ewe can then build up more milk, she can be milked, and then the lamb's reunited with the ewe, um, and the lamb can then continue to, to suckle from the ewe. So it's considered the mixed system of suckling and machine milking, and that's routinely used for sheep and goat systems overseas. But there is no data out there of how that actually works in a pastoral-based system. Um, and in New Zealand, what we want to try and do is see if we can actually wean those lambs earlier um, or to start that weaning process earlier so we can maximise the amount of commercial milk um, for the producer. So get that six weeks wean down to something much earlier. Um, those international studies suggest that you can increase commercial milk yield by about 25-27%, so it could be worth our while. So the aim of this study was to, to have a look at that system on a small scale and to evaluate what effect did early weaning of those lambs have on the growth of the lambs, what effect did it have on rumen and metabolic and immune function of those lambs? Now those results are still pending because we've not long finished the study, so maybe next year I can tell you about that, those results. Also to look at the commercial milk production and composition, um, and samples have been taken uh, by our team to look at composition, so I won't be talking about that, but again that might be coming next year. And also the practicalities of the system. How simple is it and um, is it something that, that could be used? So just as an overview of what we did, there was 50 ewes in each group. Now they were a mixture of singles, twins and, and triplet bearing ewes, so we didn't target one particular um, birth rank. Uh, the separation was simply at two weeks of age. Uh, the ewes that were in that early weaning group had their lambs separated from them for eight hours a day. So the ewes were brought in, the lambs were drafted off and put in a separate pen and the ewes were taken back to the paddock. Those lambs had access to a solid feed, and it's the same solid feed that ha they had access to out in the paddock with their mum, so it wasn't anything new. Um, and then at four weeks of age, those lambs, provided they had got to about 10 to 12 kilos um, of live weight, or had at least doubled their birth weight for the, for the multiple born lambs, um, and looked in reasonably good condition and health, um, they were weaned. And that was compared to about a, a five to six week weaning age in our control group. Now those control animals um, in the standard weaning group had not been separated from their mothers at all. Um, there was no pre-weaning milking of those ewes in that standard weaning system, but as soon as we started taking those lambs away from their mums at two weeks of age, those ewes were milked once a day. And they were milked, um, and as soon as they went through the uh, milking parlour, they were reunited with their lambs and went back out to the paddock. And then after weaning, all the ewes were milked twice a day. 
Um, and the supplement that the, the lambs were getting um, while they were separated was the same supplement that the ewes and lambs from both groups were getting out in the paddock. So in terms of results, um, the main criteria that we were interested in um, for the first part was to look at the growth rate of the lambs. Did separating those lambs from the ewes at two weeks of age compromise their growth? And the short answer is no, it didn't. So the, on the left-hand side, has got the pre-weaning average daily gain, and in both groups, they were, all those lambs were doing about 300 grams a day. In uh, post-weaning, there was a decline in the growth rate, down to about 150 grams a day, but that didn't differ between both of those, both of those groups. Now, that uh, post-weaning growth rate um, decline is quite common in a pasture-based system. Um, and compared to what you would see in an international system, you can see much higher rates of growth, but that's when you're feeding the lambs a concentrate feed. Um, and the commercial milk um, yield that was um, estimated in the study, we didn't have the opportunity to measure individual milk yields on these ewes, and so it was really just an estimate of overall commercial yield, and we're hoping to be able to do it in more detail this year, but the estimate was that there was about a 25% increase. Um, that's similar to what's been observed overseas, and I think sort of the, the take-home factor is that um, the, the farmer that we were working with in the study has said that they will do it again next year. They'll have another go at it, so I think that's a pretty good indication that it went well. So just in conclusion, um, growth rate wasn't adversely affected by the early weaning of those lambs. Um, we're yet to determine the effect on immune function and rumen development, but overall the growth rates of those lambs and the health of those lambs have been, been fine. So it's similar to what's been observed overseas in indoor systems. Um, we do need to refine some on-farm practice, and I'll talk about that just in a minute, and it does give the opportunity to yield more commercial milk. From a practical perspective, overall it was a really positive experience having the science team work with the, the farm team. Um, I think we, we had a lot of fun doing the trial, but we also learnt a lot from each other, and so I think it was a really positive experience um, with, with science working with industry to try and find some practical solutions. Um, I think the feedback um, from, from the farm staff is that having the focus on the trial actually gave them a lot more sort of focus on their day-to-day -day activities and close attention to what they were doing with their feeding and their animals and their practices because it was in a trial situation and, and the feedback was that that was actually a very positive thing for their system. Good drafting systems are required for something like this. Um, so we had a situation where we needed to pick up those lambs and put them into a separate pen. Um, that gets pretty challenging when those lambs get pretty big. Um, so obviously you need a good drafting system. There was some uh, teak damage in some of those ewes because of course when the lambs go back with the ewes they're pretty hungry and so they, they give mum hell. Um, so there was some, some damage there and that does need to be considered um, for future systems. So there does need to be some pra um, practical uh, refinement done on farm but the, the early results is that it's promising um, and as I said earlier the feedback is that um, the farmer is keen to have another go at this next year. Uh, and so we'll be keen to work alongside and um, to, to see the performance that we can get in a subsequent system and actually measure more accurately the impact on commercial milk yield. Oops. And just finally, wanted to um, thank the team very much. We had a mixture of scientists and technicians and um, overseas interns as well, so this has been a great opportunity for, for teaching our students. Um, and a big thank you to our, our industry partners. Um, wouldn't have been possible without without their support, um, and to MB for, for funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, over here. We, uh, we had a, a farmer in, in um, Victoria that decided to trial this year taking the lambs away and he did it during the day so from you know the the morning milking through the evening um, what happened with his milk is that he had a significant reduction of protein not of fat so the fat levels were the same the proteins were halved did you actually test the milk in the two groups when you did this study so samples have been collected from those ewes. They haven't been analysed yet, uh, but we also did the separation during the day, so it'll certainly be interesting to see what happens in terms of the composition of the milk. Yeah, so we don't have those results yet. Could I get a copy from you when you've done them? 
I'm sure that the results will be published at some point. <laughs> yes? Great. Any other questions? There's one around here. Just a short question around uh, the lambs that were separated every day. Do you have any mothering issues with those lambs at all? Do we have any mothering issues? You miss mothering, yeah. Just no. No, from two weeks of age, um, they've already formed a very strong bond with their mother. Um, if you start to do it very early on, then yes, it's, it's likely to have, have issues. And we had small numbers in this group. We're not doing it en masse either. Um, so I think those two factors probably contributed to us not having any issues. Great. Thank you very much, Sue. OK, last up um, in this session is Natalie Watkins and Bob Langhurst, who tackle the very important uh, issue of effluent management. And in all industry now, um, sustainability and environmental concern are just um, so overwhelmingly important that it's good to see this incorporated within the research study. Oh, thank you very much, Max. Um, so as you said, we're going to talk about the last research aim within the MB program, and that is all around the environmental footprint of the dairy sheep industry. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to be doing this with a co-presentation with my colleague Bob Longhurst as well. And I just wanted to acknowledge our other colleague, Chris Smith, who's done a lot of the technical work as well for here. So. So our presentation today, first of all, I'm going to cover off with a bit of an overview of our research aim and what we're hoping to do within the four years, five years of this program. Then we're going to go into more detail looking at the effluent objective, understanding the effluent volumes, effluent concentrations, and comparing this with other industry dairy systems. Also going to look at effluent delivery systems and mention some of the rules and regulations that you need to have in mind when you're looking at your effluent systems. So our research aim has five objectives. The first one was all around getting a greater understanding of the dairy sheep system. We did this via a literature review and also having a closer look at our case study farms and understanding how nutrients move and flow through the system. The second objective is one that we'll be talking about a lot more today, and that was all around understanding the dairy effluent, the volumes, the concentrations, and then looking forward to some best management practice guidelines. Our third objective was understanding the modelling framework. In New Zealand, the computer model overseer is used a lot to look at understanding how nutrient, what nutrient losses are from a farm system. And at the moment, obviously, dairy sheep are not part of that computer program, but getting an understanding of what information would be needed for that to be incorporated into overseer. And our last two objectives are the objectives that are coming up in the coming years. And one of them was looking at understanding what a dairy, or designing a low footprint dairy system would look like. And the last objective is doing some field validation trials, so actually getting out on farm and doing some on farm measurements of nitrogen leaching. So, as I mentioned, the objective we're going to be covering off today is all around the dairy effluent, dairy sheep effluent. So the aim of this objective was to characterise the nutrient concentrations on our case study farms and quantify the volumes and flows of that effluent. <coughs> the outcome from this objective is that we're going to have a report on, e on the case study farms, that understanding what their nutrient concentrations were and some of the problems that we may have come across. And lastly, we'll also have a fact sheet, which will be sort of a best management practice guideline that can be utilised out there. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague who will run through the next few slides. Right, so we want to know um, what was uh, the amount of the volumes um, that are generated at the dairy shed, what's actually in the effluent, and to get an idea of when it actually goes out on the land, what, what sort of um, application depth, um, both nutrient-wise and hydraulic loading. So what is um, effluent? So it's the stock, ex stock excreter um, deposited at the dairy shed and um, in it. It's the wash down water used in the, in the holding yard and for cleaning the, the dairy shed itself. And then um, there's the milk back cleaning. This may or may not be a daily occurrence, particularly on the um, smaller, um, smaller operators. It might be a, a pickup every second or third day. 
Um, rainfall can have a, a big bearing on the amount of effluent generated, um, particularly if the, uh, the rainfall falling on a dairy shed, if that's diverted or not. If, it, if, if it's not, it's going into the effluent stream and it could be a positive in the summertime if you want moisture, it's a big negative in the winter if you don't. So um, from our findings so far, it um, looks like the, the average um, volume is somewhere between 5 to 10 litres per year per day. In comparison with a dairy cow farm, it's more like 50 to 70 litres. If anyone's tried to um, move a cow pat on a dairy, dairy yard, you'll know it take a lot, mo <laughs> a lot more um, moving to um, get, get them um, into the waste stream. Uh, if sheep are housed in barns, the, um, the effluent volume is going to increase um, considerably because uh, stock are in that barn for a, a longer length of time and also you've got a huge uh, surface area there. So um, what we've found so far from our effluent composition, this is about 30, 35 samples. Um, we've got the actual solids content, it's only like around about 0.4% roughly. Um, nitrogen content, um, 0.17, that's the mean, but there's quite a bit of variation, so we've got a, a median there as well. And whereas there's not much variation in between uh, in, in phosphorus and sulphur between the mean and the median, there is certainly is for nitrogen. And you can see with the, um, with the range here, uh, uh, um, for nitrogen it's quite a, quite a bit, tenfold. Uh, the other point to note is it's a, a nitrogen, uh, it's a, the effluent's a nitrogen rich product. Lost my and um, f closely followed by potassium. <coughs> so how does it compare with other dairy effluents? Um, there's a lot of information around on dairy cow. There's um, like hundreds of samples. When it comes to goats, very limited. It's only about a dozen samples. And like I say, we had 30 odd samples for, for dairy sheep. But the um, solids content is quite a quite a variation. I'm, I don't know why the goat figure is so high. Maybe that's just because it's such a small population that we're working with. Um, note that all the effluents are nitrogen rich, um, followed by potassium. It's a, it's a similar theme all, all the way through. Um, what is a little bit different with the sheep effluent is that the if you like, the ratio between nitrogen and, f and uh, potassium is a lot closer. So that has a bit of a bearing of you, when it comes to actually putting it out on pasture. If you were putting out, uh, say, 100 kilograms of nitrogen, you, you'd be putting out um, what, 80 or 90 uh, kilograms of uh, potassium, and that may be well in excess of what your um, pasture potassium requirements are. When it comes to uh, nutrient value, um, the sheep effluent um, looks like it's uh, less this is on a per cubic metre, around about $5. And um, the main reason for that is it's got a lower um, phosphorus content, and phosphorus is the most um, expensive nutrient. It's um, more than twice what it the uh, cost of nitrogen and potassium. Um, this graph here just shows the um, relationship between solids content and nitrogen. So as, as the solids content um, increases, so does the, the nitrogen content. And so if you've got um, effluent looks a little bit like coloured water, it's going to have a fairly low nitrogen content. But as, as that effluent gets darker and darker, it's getting, it's more enriched and, and the nitrogen all, and all the other nutrients are going to be uh, more concentrated. So it's um, a normal setup on, a, on any um, farm when it comes to effluent management. You've got uh, your dairy shed, a holding yard, there's normally um, a stone, stone trap and then followed by a sump. 
And at this point, you can either have direct land application, um, usually um, a travelling irrigator, or it could go into storage, and then there's um, an option to use a travelling irrigator again or a, lo a low application system. And these um, have their role to play in situations where there might be a high risk soil or it could be on sloping ground, they're, um, they're very good. There's another option too, uh, a, a solid, some form of solid separation could go in at that stage if necessary. So th these are the typical um, delivery systems that are out there. Um, most common is a travelling irrigator. That, as for those you, of you who are not familiar, as the boom goes around, it just ratchets itself up and, and drags itself across the paddock. Um, this one here is a, st a stationary rain gun. So it's just in one, in one spot and it would basically fire across the room here. That they're spread, whereas a travelling irrigator would normally be, like say from where I am, to here. So I, I normally do a, um, a smaller radius. Um, down here is a, it's a bit of recent technology, it's a, basically a combination of both of these. So it's a, it's a rain gun set up on a, on a travelling setup. So once again it's got this wire and it just ratchets itself up goes across the paddock. Um, the advantage is you've got that, still got that huge spread, um, but and while it's travelling, and it, <coughs> the end result is that the application depth to land is, is, quite, is quite low. It can be well under 10 millimetres, which can be um, uh, quite important at different times of the year. Then we have these um, systems here called low application. There's various setups. It could be one pod. It could be, in this case, it's about half a dozen, and they just squirt right from here. Be lucky to get to the wall there. So they're, they're very good in situations where it's uh, sloping land or you're on a very, um, what we call a high risk soil. So it's got poor drainage. So um, this is a typical um, spreading distribution from these different systems. You've got a travelling irrigator. They tend to have this donut pattern. It's very uh, much higher rate on the outside. So um, there's a bit of centrifugal force as it goes around, and <coughs> so you get quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of variability. In this case, it's up close to 30 millimetres down to one. So huge range, it probably averages about 15. Whereas the, the more the pod system or low application, um, that, that variability is a lot less. And so what that means is that from a, a nutrient point of view, you're getting a more even spread. Um, this is um, some results, this is from dairy farms and the Lake River Fakaitu catchment I did a few years ago. Um, just looking at specifically for travelling irrigators and the speed that they were going. And you see, if you're if on a fast setting, it zooms across the um, ground like 60 metres in an hour, so a metre a second, a metre a minute rather. Um, the application depth is lower and nutrients applied are lower. You slow that system the travelling irrigator down, so it's only covered 24 metres, the depth is doubled, and the, the nutrient loading is um, getting, pretty high, getting pretty high. Oops, where are we? Yeah, so um, that 124 might be okay from a nitrogen point of view, point of view, but when you get to uh, potassium, you, once again you're getting um, well in excess of what what the pasture needs are. So th these are the things um, to bear in mind. Um, rules and regulations. So uh, the dairy sheep industry would come under the same rules that the dairy cow industry has to um, 
Continua, and that they're governed by uh, various regional councils um, around the country. It's, uh, they come under these resource consents or permitted activity rules. Um, but also, each um, various district councils may also have um, their own specific rules, and that could be like a withholding distance to a dwelling, to an historic site, things like that. Uh, the nutrient loading is uh, one of the most important things that the regional councils focus on, and it's normally 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Or if it's a crop, say you know, it's, you're growing maize for silage, for example, um, you might be able to put on up to 200 kilograms of, of nitrogen per hectare. Um, the other thing they've focused on is that having an application depth um, below 25 millimetres. Um, this is to avoid any um, ponding. The councils frown very strongly on that. And their big, big uh, point is not to allow any effluent to enter a waterway. And that, so that requires uh, good management around um, placement and timing. So yeah, take home messages is to um, understand local rules and regulations. Um, and uh, understand your soil types too, because there's, um, there's free draining soils, there's poor draining soils, and it's getting the right mix and match there. Um, and to install the appropriate um, delivery system, whether it be uh, a travelling irrigator, um, a travelling rain gun, or a low application system, um, it's a good idea. It's certainly a good idea to monitor your application depth to get um, just an idea of how. Uh, how even that distribution is, and and you can it's well worthwhile because you're maximising your your return of nutrients in a more efficient manner. Um, sufficient storage, this, uh, it's a biggie in the dairy cow industry. The regional councils requiring um, farmers to put in huge storage ponds in a lot of cases. So I, I'm not sure if that's going to come to the dairy sheep industry in in time. Um, solids management, something to bear in mind. Um, it, it follows on with the, the next point about the wool fibres, that, that they can cause issues with um, pumps and um, plumbing and so on. So having um, some form of solid separation could be a way um, to uh, mitigate that. I'd just like to acknowledge... Um, uh, MB and the case study farms we're involved with and also our ag, ag research colleagues. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, time for a question or two. Is there any out there? Yes. Just a few questions for you, uh, Bob. Uh, I'll probably talk to you afterwards because I've got a whole heap of questions. But <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just quite interested in the farm you tested. Um, so you said there were 30 sheep farms, sheep milking farms, is that right? Or 30 tests? Or uh, 30 actual analysis, analysis. from basically from pre farms. Yeah. Pre farms, okay. Um, were they indoor or outdoor grazing, a bit of both? Or no, they, they were all um, pasture based. Yep. And all the samples were um, from sumps. Well, yeah, okay. from the effluent that come from a sump, um, I'm not I'm not sure down in Southland they might have actually been from the sump. The ones I collected myself were all out in the paddock from, from whatever right, the yeah. delivery system was. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I was interested in the point you uh, mentioned about the uh, dry matter and the goat samples being higher, yeah. possibly higher. Is that likely from what I've seen and been involved with a lot of the goat farms don't have storage, so potentially because you're testing from sumps rather than maybe from ponds, do you think that might be the difference? Uh, when they got the goat samples, I'm, I'm not quite sure how, how they were sampled. Mm. I'm pretty sure they weren't from the paddock, so I, my suspicion was they'd be from a sump. And it's a, a, getting a, s a sample from a sump is, is highly variable. You know, <laughs> what, what part of the milking... Uh, you know, do you get do you get your sample? Whereas out in the paddock, if you've got a, um, a collection tray and you've got that whole that that irrigator's gone past, you've got the whole 20, 30 minutes or whatever. It's it's a much more 
representative sample to get. Sure. Mm. So what about um, tainting of grass? They always talk about that with the uh, goat and sheep milk um, and, and to maximise area or even irrigate onto areas you know, um, outside of the sheep grazing. Is yeah, yeah I, know, um, I know goats certainly don't like getting uh, like cut and carry pasture that's been um, ir irrigated with fair effluent. Um, I'm not sure if sheep are so, um, susceptible to it, but yeah. um, n normally, if the, if the application depth is, is following the gui so, you know, guidelines, and, and it's say, say it's 10 millimetres, and it's two or three weeks before that um, that, that paddock's grazed, that shouldn't be an issue at all. Oh, good. That's good to know. Um, yeah, one thing I, I would have thought, especially with the um, Going into ponds, uh, some of the stuff we've done is, yeah, irrigating from the pond is, is ideal for that reason because you're getting a lot of dilution, agitation, and you're, you're getting a more even application of your nutrients every time you irrigate rather than the variability from the sump. Sometimes it's very watery, sometimes it's very deep. Yeah, yeah uh, there is two, two things to bear in mind, though, if you are irrigating from a pond. Is that you, is you're going to bear some nitrogen losses because mm -hmm. it's going to be volatilisation. And, and the other thing is that um, some of the um, solids, suspended solids that go into a pond, they'll, they'll settle out and that'll take some of the nitrogen with it and what happens, you get a flip-flop, you're going to end up with a, usually a potassium-rich effluent. Yeah, no, for sure, yeah, good agitation is key. And then just to mention with the stone traps, just from witnessing, um, with goat and, and sheep, um, we're finding a, a lot easier to process the sheep and goat effluent over a cow due to just uh, the fibre content. Um, seeing, mm. you know, the way the, the, the sheep and the goats are processing it, you're not finding as much fibre in longer strands and the effluent would yeah. tend to get caught up in your stone traps and give you all the headaches that dairy farmers find. Yeah, <laughs> I can see we can have a good discussion over a beer later. Yeah, yeah. sweet. <laughs> Thank you. After those questions, anybody else? No, that... Um, the talk we've heard today is really important um, around establishing those parameters for um, environmental sustainability. So thank you very much. <laughs> now, just before we break um, for our afternoon tea, we have um, a poster by Aladdin from Otago University. If you could stick your hand up. He's not here. He's not here. Ah, where's the poster? Poster will be out there, so make sure you have a look at that. And that's the mineral content of New Zealand sheep milk from different lactation stage and times and milk fractions. So that poster will be out there to um, have a look at as well. And just really to summarise this session, um, it's been really good to see the integrated approach across growth, composition, um, efficacy and also um, environmental sustainability within the programme. Um, one of the things that struck me about the session is we are starting to see the emergence of a unique New Zealand aspect to the sheep milk industry, and that's really a good point of differentiation that will help us uh, in the marketplace. So um, just also to emphasise that R&D is, is really important for industry at this early stage to develop that competitive advantage and build a really solid platform of of um, knowledge that can either go into practices, it can go into marketing, it can go into health claims, a whole range of things. So really important uh, program. Thank you very much for your attention and we're afternoon tea from 3.30 to 3.45 and then we've got the manuf International Manufacturing and Regulation session by Opus. Thank you.
please go and reserve your spot with Amber. Amber, can you put your hand up? Amber with the curly hair. Um, and it, all the team there in the blue T-shirts are going to be your shuttle drivers. So please make the most of that so you can have a couple of bevies tonight and wind down and relax. Just another quick note, um, administration-wise, if you are going to ask a question in this next session, could you please just briefly say your name and what company uh, you're with? That would be very helpful. It is my pleasure now to introduce the chair of our next session, which is the Opus International Manufacturing and Regulation Session. And the chair today is Dr Mark Dresser, who is the Principal Rural Consultant at Opus International Consultants. Prior to working for Opus, Mark's had a very illustrious career. He's worked for Fonterra globally, uh, looking at milk quality standards in their sourcing of milk. He's also worked for Landcare Research. He's uh, been a lecturer at Cranfield University, and he has a doctorate in mechanical engineering. So welcome to the stage, Mark. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I've been talking to a few people around uh, today, and not many people actually know what Opus do. Um, so if I can urge you to go to our stand and pick up a, uh, a leaflet on the way through, um, that should give you an indication of what we do. But what we're about is Opus is about uh, building thriving and resilient rural uh, communities by the application and utilization of innovative and appropriate, appropriate uh, technologies and promoting the wise use of natural resources. So a natural fit for Opus to support the Sheep Milking New Zealand Conference. So as I say, please do stop by the stand and have a chat with uh, myself, Gareth or Libby um, over the next few days. Realise we're a bit pushed for time, and all that stands between you and your uh, pre-dinner drink is this. So, uh, without further ado, we'll move on to the presentations. The first presenter is Matt. He is an, uh, he's the only um, ag research person in Auckland, works, works on his own. And Matt's area of expertise is um, a farm uh, products, human nutrition. So, Matt, if you'd like to uh, give your presentation, please. And uh, if you'd like to ask questions at the end, uh, please do. Please put your hand up. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here amongst so many fellow sheep lovers. Um, and I hope you're all comfortable in your own personalised microclimate. Um, I am aware that I am standing between you and drinks, so I shall take a leaf out of my colleague Linda's book and be as concise as I can. So between you and me, composition and health benefits of sheep's milk. So what I'm going to talk to you briefly about today uh, is a literature review that we're currently underway with, and that is to find out what is out there. So we've already heard a bit about some of the literature that has been read and what's known. Um, I think we need to know what is known, and therefore we need to know what else we need to research and understand. And so the particular focus is on composition of sheep's milk, how is it different, and what might that have implications for in terms of health benefits. And particular interest is comparison to cow milk and goat milk. And I would like to, uh, to point out this is jointly funded by Blue River and Ag Research. And so it's been a privilege to work alongside Blue River pulling this together. And it, it is a work in progress. But we thought we'd um, draw your attention to it and give you an idea of where we've got to and where we think we're going. And so the question is, we know milk is good because milk is an important source of nutrition. So cow milk is good. Is there evidence that maybe goat milk is better and sheep milk is best of all? Or is there evidence that any aspects of these milks, we might be able to say something like that? So very briefly, I'm going to talk about the search, um, the databases we've looked at, the strategy we have used, um, summarize the search results so far, and then just talk about three components of composition and three components of the nutritional value and health benefits angle. And then just summarize it all up and, and see where we're at. And again, sheep versus goat versus cow. So in terms of the review, basically we, we cast as wide a net as possible. So initially we're looking at um, a range of the scientific databases out there and asking the question, 
And you can see from the initial search strategy, covering ovine, bovine, caprine, or sheep, goat, cow, sheep, goats, cows, trying to get all those combinations. Um, composition or component or comparison or comparative. And then looking at health benefits, nutritional quality. Very wide net. What is it that we can find out what's out there that's known already? Um, and as we've been going, we've been refining the search to focus more on aspects of composition, on particular aspects of nutritional value or health benefits as we identify them, go back and research, make sure we're not missing anything. Um, and some, an example of one that's come up, which has already been mentioned a couple of times, is total milk solids. There appears to be difference between sheep and other ruminants. So what is really the evidence out there on an international basis? and things like digestibility. So are there particular potential benefits and what's the good evidence out there? Um, I guess the, the, the goal is we want to, to build sheep milk as a value added product and to do that, if you want to make any claims, you really need to have a solid scientific basis. So what's the current scientific basis and what do we collectively need to do in terms of empowering the New Zealand sheep industry? Um, so. So far, there's something slightly over 500 references, um, which seems quite a lot, and when you've got to read them all, it's quite a lot. Um, but to give you, put that in context, um, just to search for bovine milk and allergy turn, returns about 2,600 references. And so clearly, there's not as much research, and this is not surprising, in the area of sheep milk as there is in bovine. So I think that's an early indication that there's some work to be done. Composition, approximately 200 in English and about 100 not English. And that's a reflection of a lot of the sheep dairying is the Mediterranean area or Eastern Europe. And so there's a lot of publications which aren't in English. Um, around about 70 English language ones on health benefits of sheep milk. 14 not English. And there's a range which are specific to sheep. So they don't look at comparison with goat or cow. Uh, but about, a, about 140 of those so far, and roughly 60 that specifically focus on allergy. So that's a very broad look at what's out there at the moment, and this is an ongoing search, so there's constantly references being added to that, but ballpark 500 references that are specifically relating to sheep milk. Now if we look particularly at composition, there's three aspects I'm going to talk about briefly. There's the uh, overall basic composition, amino acid composition and then a little bit on lipids and I know you've already heard a bit about lipids from someone who knows much more about it than I do. Um, so if we're looking at overall composition and I think this is pretty clear, total solids in sheep milk is quite a bit higher than either goat or cow. Also protein, also fat and resulting overall energy is higher. Now it's also been noted that Lactose is about the same, and so that might have issues relating to any claims you might make around lactose tolerance. Although, because the total solids are higher, when you're looking at milk powder, then the percentage lactose would be a little bit lower in sheep milk. So whether that's an issue or not, we're not quite sure. But certainly there are some fairly well characterised differences, but again, as we've heard, this might be different in the New Zealand situation. And I think Max made it pretty clear, if you can't measure it, it's not there. So we need to know what it is in the New Zealand system and whether that's different and make sure that that's very clearly understood. Um, if we look particularly at amino acids, in general, amino acid composition is higher and that's partly a reflection of the fact that there's more protein. Um, but it's also the case that there are certain amino acids that are relatively higher and um, this is just highlighting the essential amino acids. So from a nutritional point of view, these are the ones that we can't manufacture ourselves. We have to take them in from what we eat. And certainly some of the essential amino acids are higher in sheep's milk. And so it's potentially a better source of those important essential amino acids than either goat or cow milk. Again, something we would need to clarify within the New Zealand system specifically. And the final example for lipids, and we've heard a little bit about this, um, but overall there's more fat in sheep's milk than either goat or cow milk. Um, and the, the, 
the point I'll just make on this one, um, talking about linolenic acid, which is an omega-3, and I'm sure you're all familiar with some of the research around the benefits of omega-3, or more specifically, the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. So omega-3s are the good fats, and omega-6s are the bad fats, although it's never quite that simple. Um, but in sheep's milk, there's higher levels of omega-3, and that results in the overall ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 being low. And now some argue that that ratio should be one to one, and as a result of industrialization, omega-6 is greatly increased, so it's more like 10 to one um, in our overall diet, and this would suggest that sheep's milk is getting back a bit closer to that one to one, so that might be a benefit of sheep milk. So that's just three examples of some compositional differences which seem to be pretty clear. Um, what's certainly less clear is what these might have in terms of relevance for health benefits or nutritional value. So three I'm going to touch on very briefly, digestibility, allergy, and bioactive components. Um, so in terms of digestibility, there are a number of factors that influence how digestible a food is, and how digestible it is, is also influences the relative benefit of it in terms of its nutritional quality. Um, and so in... in Specifically talking about milk, the curd formation in the stomach, so when you drink milk and it hits your stomach acid, the proteins crash out of solution, in particular caseins, and different milks form different curds which are differently digestible. Uh, the protein composition can have an influence on how well it's digested, and just a couple examples there, casein content or the casein to whey protein ratio. Uh, micelle structure, so this is a picture of a casein micelle. And the structure of that determines how readily digestible or not it is. Um, it is known that there are differences in the digestibility of individual proteins. So, for example, a specific casein protein from cow's milk might be less readily digestible than from sheep's milk, and also the size of milk fat globules. So all of these things can impact on how easily or not the milk is digested. So some of these differences are well established. So... The, the protein beta-lactoglobulin is more easily digestible when it comes from either goat or sheep than it is from cow. Um, sheep and goat milk have smaller fat globules, and that means they are more readily digestible than those from bovine milk. And also, it's known that bovine milk tends to produce, produce a fairly solid, dense curd when in, you swallow it, which is harder to digest. And we do know that other ruminant milks are softer curd, more readily digestible, and it's more closely mimicking human milk. So again, that may be an advantage, but it's not entirely clear. Um, and there's a lot that's still not known. So I think this is an opportunity, because digestibility can have important consequences for its health attributes, and we need to know more. I think it's definitely an opportunity that could differentiate sheep milk. Um, health benefits allergy. As I said, there's about 60 references, and they express a wide range of opinion. So, two extremes there. There's one case that says if someone's allergic to cow's milk, they shouldn't drink any milk from any species whatsoever. And that was fairly categorically stated in that particular one. Um, ranging to, and this is just particularly talking about goat's milk, but there's a guaranteed space in the market because of its high biological value and low allergenicity. So they're essentially saying quite different things. Um, allergy is a tri tricky area, it's complex. Um, certainly in cases of severe allergy, if someone's severely allergic to cow's milk, it's unlikely that they would tolerate milk from another ruminant. But we do know that there are cases of low level allergy or intolerance, where goats or sheep's milk can be more readily tolerated. And we've heard a story about that where a woman, a breastfeeding mother, the milk that they drink can influence the tolerance of their child. So there are clearly cases there. Um, also, that how the milk is digested can influence how the antigenic proteins are presented, and that also has implications. Um, but really, we just don't quite know. You've got to be very careful if you say anything about allergens because the consequences of allergic reactions can be very bad. Um, 
So we definitely need more research in this area. Um, it's a bit of a recurring theme, really. More research is needed. This isn't a funding plug. It's not just about getting more money for science. Um, the level of data available internationally is just not sufficient at the moment. But I think the level of anecdotal evidence suggests this could be a real opportunity for sheep's milk. But you might want to pitch it more towards tolerance than allergy. Uh, finally, I'll just talk briefly about um, some examples of bioactives. Um, and not a lot, so uh, there were 12 references we've found so far. I'm pretty sure there's a few more, but when you're specifically talking about sheep's milk bioactives, there's a lot that hasn't been reported yet. Um, so two examples here, lactadherin, um, which potentially has biological activity in terms of antiviral for treating gastroenteritis, so a natural way to treat an upset tummy. Uh, what is known is that it's species dependent, so the lactadherin from goat may be different from sheep, may be different from cow, um, and this may result in different functional consequences. We don't know enough yet. And lactoferrin, I'm sure many of you will have heard of lactoferrin, and in particular that the peptides from lactoferrin have antibacterial properties, and it's relatively well established that sheep milk has very high levels of lactoferrin relative to goat or to cow. Um, two final examples, um, and these are relating to cardiac or, or blood pressure, so um, angiotensin converting enzymes, basically it's about controlling high blood pressure, and there's possibility that compounds from milk can do that effectively, an alternative to pharmaceutical interventions perhaps, um, and there's a fair amount in bovine milk, but it's increasingly becoming obvious that these are present in other ruminant milks and that, that might represent an opportunity because they may have different functionality. And the same is the case for antithrombotic peptides. So anyone flown in from far away for this conference? Anyone worried about deep vein thrombosis on the way? We all walk up and down the plane aisles now just to make sure. Um, so maybe, who knows, in 10 years time you might be able to just drink your sheep milk before you get on the plane and you won't need to worry about walking. Um, <laughs> Well, that, that, could, that could be a gross exaggeration, I'm not sure. Certainly there is evidence that these peptides from sheep have a greater activity than those from cow or goat, but what those peptides are is not as well known. There's a, a fraction which has that activity that needs to be better characterised. Gosh, that seemed a fairly short summary of what seemed like a bit of hard work. But <laughs> there was, I, was, I was truncating it for your benefit, of course. Um, there are clear differences in the composition of sheep's milk compared to other ruminants, but we need to know this better for the New Zealand situation, and obviously we are starting to get that information together, which is great to see, because we need to know what the differences are, we need to have measured them so that we can clearly state them and capitalise on any of those differences. And then we need to understand how those differences might impact on the nutritional value or the health benefits derived from sheep milk compared to other milks. And I've just given three examples. Digestibility, allergy, bioactives. I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think more research is clearly needed. It's going on. That's great. Um, but if we want to make any claims to get value added for these sheep milk products, we need to have the right science in place. And we need to be very careful about how we do that but it's all good. Um, thanks to Blue River, uh, who have contributed generously to, to funding this, um, and also AgriSearch. And I acknowledge Joy, who is our, one of our knowledge advisors, who has been very helpful with the search. And the idea is that this is information that will be shared for the good of the New Zealand industry. So I think we've all got a vested interest in seeing this succeed. Thanks very much. Matt, thank you very much for that. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions, and I've got the first one. Um, you say it's species dependent. Is it also uh, breed dependent? Because if you look at a uh, Jersey's Holstein Friesians, for instance. So what I learned there are very many sheep breeds. Who knew there were so many sheep breeds? I don't know. There's dozens of them, apparently. 
And, and yes, it's, it is, it's breed dependent, it's feed dependent, it's um, year dependent, it's country dependent. Um, one, of the, one, of them, one of the references said that there's greater variability within the sheep of a given flock, even if they're the same breed, than between different breeds. So apparently everything is a source of variability. Uh, <laughs> Which is confusing, but I, I guess, so then you need to know what's in a particular product in terms of the benefit that you're trying to show. But it, it's a tricky question. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Matt? There's a little bit. Um, which suggests it may not be good news for sheep milk. So the, the oligosaccharides are probably higher in goat's milk, and sheep milk and cow's milk are on a par. But again, quantity is not necessarily the only thing. So what are the types of oligosaccharides? Are you comfortable with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, I, I wasn't limited to those categories. That was just an example of where we've got to. Another one at the back there. Did you find anything around cholesterol? Good cholesterol, um, good, bad cholesterol in good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. Yes, there has been some mention of cholesterol. So I'm digging a bit more deeply into that. I wouldn't want to say anything now because I might mislead someone, but I believe there's some story in there that needs to be further enunciated. Hmm. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Okay. 